recent years, we Americans have experienced unprecedented division, not simply in the national arena between political parties, but in many cases within our own families. It begs the question worthy of our most ardent prayer and efforts. Could it be otherwise? Is it possible to be truly united? What is the real hope for the prayer our Lord taught us? Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. As a simple answer, consider this. What if the sea of humanity were able to view the Star Wars first movie together for the first time? Would any of us come out disappointed that Darth Vader was defeated or that Luke Skywalker prevailed? Without diminishing some very real and important differences, peel back the layers and there's something healthy, alive, and beating in the common heart of our humanity, the heart of our republic. What if we could rediscover this common heart? Right now is an important moment in human history, and you and I are appointed and anointed to play an important role. What follows was delivered at a recent Belief and Beverages Night sponsored by Image Trinity and Mass Impact. Jonathan Jakubowski, a dynamic young husband, father, business leader, author, speaker, and movement leader, painted a moving portrait of what might happen if we rediscover the human heart endowed by God with the capacity to unite local communities, to work together towards that which is true and good. Together, we are about the awakening heart of conservatism. If you are interested in helping us extend this message and movement further, find out more and please financially support us. Go to ilovemyfamily.us. That's ilovemyfamily.us. My dad had heard about football tryouts. Now, we didn't know that it was for Catholics only. You had to attend the school or had to go to the church. So I show up at the football field and just go out there and start doing drills. I end up being on the St. Rose sixth grade football team, and I was a star running back. So about midway through the season, they go through and they do this kind of taking inventory of their players because you either have to be in the parish attending or you have to be at the school. So they come to me and ask me, and I don't know this rule, and they're like, so you attend the parish on Sundays? And I was like, no. I was like, well, do you go to school? No. I was like, what are you doing here? You're not allowed to be here. You're not Catholic. And they said, we're not going to say anything. We're going to mark you down as the parish. Just come to one service, please. Come to one service. <laughs> So I did go to St. Rose for, for one service and was, was then welcomed into uh, to the Catholic faith virtue by virtue of football, which is one of my love languages. <laughs> what I believe that we are seeing in the church in this moment is we see right wing, I think the term that I've heard is Christian nationalism. Now, I don't like adopting terms from culture, but let's put it this way. You have those that have exchanged the power and truth of the gospel for the ability to claim a nation as their God. All right, patriotism. Patriotism becomes that thing that I am most enamored by and I will give my life to, and the church is a place where I can mobilize people for that mission. I think at the farthest extent of that, you have seen an exchange for that which is good and true and beautiful, in exchange for something that is very temporal and short-sighted. On the other side, we see denominations of the left who have embraced postmodern sexuality, leftism, the doctrine that secular society wants to bring down on us in every possible way. And then instead of that which is good and beautiful and true being taught, instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ and its power being delivered, what we see instead is a cheap version of the gospel embracing those and becoming woke in many ways. Now, both of those ideologies at their farthest extent, at the farthest wings, look a lot like each other. They're doing the same thing. They're using elements of the gospel in order to fulfill something that is of greater ends to them. The gospel is only a means. It is not an end. So as the church, we must understand, first of all, what the true end is. What is the true end? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. No question at all. And staying in that lane teaches us a great deal about how we are to respond in this cultural moment. So I spoke about the horseshoe effect. I've talked a little bit about the, the splits of the American church, but I think what we're missing, because we, I think we know that, we kind of understand that. But when I talk about understanding the times, it's just not understanding that which is made most relevant to us at face, what we can see pretty easily and what culture is telling to us. I mean, we hear critiques all the time of the neo-Nazi Christian nationalists. And then when you go to conservative media, you hear a lot about how there's these crazy uh, left-wingers that are out here and churches that are being deluded. We hear a lot of those things. I think we know that. 
But what is beneath the surface is the question I want to ask tonight and seek to address. There's two words I want you to try to learn, and this comes from a book that I want to recommend to you that is not my own. Uh, you'll, you'll enjoy that, but the one that might be even better is called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. If you haven't heard of it, it's a strong book recommendation because it speaks to this cultural moment. You see, what we live in today is, is not something that is, was caused today. The French Revolution didn't cause the French Revolution. The advancement of the agenda of sexuality wasn't caused by the advancement of the agenda of sexuality. There are things that go much deeper into the context of these ideologies which lead us into this cultural moment. And the two words I want to point out are one, poesis, and this, number two is mimesis, but I'll start in reverse order. What is mimesis? Mimesis is a vision of the world that speaks to an outside-in philosophy. What do I mean by that? It means that the environment that surrounds me has a formative effect on my worldview. I discover my purpose by figuring out how I fit into the world by the way the world describes it to me. What do I mean by that? Let's go back to the 17th century and talk about a farmer. A farmer that lived in the 17th century was wholly dependent upon the rain that came from heaven, upon the supply chain that was very tentative that existed and people that were connected to them, upon the, the changing of the seasons. I mean, think into the 19th century, the Great Potato Famine. The farmers there, they were wholly dependent upon these excesses that existed in the macro environment that they recognized the fragility of their life and the limited ability that they had to control their own destiny. I mean, Macy's worldview is one where you recognize that there are external things that I must figure out and adapt to to ascertain what my purpose in life looks like. So who are the counselors that help you understand what your role in the world looks like? Well, these counselors, the therapists, this is the church, it's the pastors, it's the laity, it's the leaders, and obviously there's poor manifestations of how the church manipulated that power that it had in those moments, but where would people go in times of crisis? Most of them went to the institutions of society that were prevailing in the place where they reigned or the place where they lived. And that is how they found the answers to life. What has happened in the last couple of centuries and has been made manifest by multiple factors, there's no singular factor here. But what has happened is we have went from a mimesis worldview to a poesis worldview. A poesis worldview is inside out, not outside in. My experience internally defines my external reality. Who controls my future and my destiny? I do. Who controls what I'm going to say about my sexuality? I do. What is the purpose of the institutions? They're to respond to what I believe is right. They're to give me a platform to explain my experience. When we live in the 21st century, one of the things you'll hear that's popular in modern culture is the idea of authenticity. When you come out of the closet, you are being authentic about your true self my true self. That's why the book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, speaks to the triumph of a poesis worldview, which substantially shifts the influence of the institutions of society and culture. Unfortunately, the church has been at best anemic in its response to the phenomena that has occurred over these last couple of centuries. Our responses have been stifled as we flail around seeking ways to try and prevent these very perverse agendas from reaching deep into the hearts of society to damage that which we know to be good and beautiful and true. Why is that? Well, I believe there's two reasons primarily, and it goes back to the fundamental reason of knowing the times. I think the church has responded to the particulars of nature with universals that are inapplicable. We miss the context. Well, let me give you an example. So, did the 9-11 tower, 9-11, did the towers, the twin towers, did they fall because of the force of gravity? What would your answer be to that? Well, yeah, right? The, 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 the buildings were debilitated and gravity ultimately led to them come crashing down. But if I were to say that, you would say, well, hold on a second. You're missing a lot of context to that story. Right? You're missing the Islamic terrorists that flew the planes into that. You're missing the ideologies that led to that event that changed the world. Well, in many ways, the church has responded to the advancement of individuals that have walked into whether an LGBT format, abortion. We've responded to it by saying, well, the problem is sin. Yes, that is a universal issue. 
But we are not responding with precision to the issue that faces our times. And it has debilitated our ability to have an effect at responding to those who struggle with that worldview and to have fluency in a culture that desperately needs the right answers. In the same breath, we have also reversed the particulars from the universals. So when it's a universal truth, such as the LGBTQ agenda, very large, they make universal truth claims and they advance a universal agenda. We wonder why in 20 years they've been able to not only get gay marriage legalized, but they've been able to now advance trans ideology. Why, do, why has that happened? Well, it's because our response in those cases is a particular response. All that we have to do is mobilize a political group to get marriage on the ballot, 2004. We get marriage on the ballot, we cut off the head, and we win. Oh, I'm sorry, we didn't win. We just cut off one head of a hydra that has countless heads that seeks to devour that which is good and beautiful and true. Unfortunately, the church has been ill-equipped and ill-fit to respond to the times that we live in. So it leads me to the natural question, if that be the case, what ought to be the church's response? I don't know that I have the words to respond satisfactorily to that answer. I think we as a church really need to consider on our knees what God would tell us, what he would inform us of our role and mission is. In fact, over the last, uh, the last few weeks, it's been, a, it's been a delight. One of the greatest joys that, that, I, that we have as being parents is seeing our kids walk in relationship with God. And our son Judah has begun to ask us every night. He asks me to sit down and he has a, a specific discipleship question. You want to know what his question was two nights ago? He said, hey, Dad, I would like to know, how can I convince somebody who doesn't believe in God's existence that not only does God exist, but he needs to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior? <laughs> That's, that's an eight-year-old. Yeah, that's an eight-year-old. I love the questions that are being asked, and I love the recognition of the power of the gospel within them, because these are the generation changers that we're raising up to be engaged in a cultural moment that if the tide doesn't shift, it's going to become, that it will be something that will become one of persecution. So I go back to the recognition that my, my limited abilities might not satisfy your desire to have the answer to that question I myself am seeking, but I think we have some clues. And one of the things that I would say, and you might find this to be uh, a, uh, you know, something that's antithetical to the truth, but I don't believe America needs a revival. Wow, what a thing to say. I'm sure many would beg to disagree. My niece here disagrees with that. No, America needs an awakening. What's the difference? All right, think of a flood. When a flood comes through, and I've heard a revival called a rushing flood multiple times, a rushing flood that comes in. When a flood comes in, it just moves out of the way, everything that was there, or it floods it, and then the waters recede, and everything's destroyed, chaotic, but it's back to normal. The rocks that were in the way of the flood maintain, rough, roughly speaking, the same shape. They haven't been transformed. An awakening looks like a brook. It looks like a brook that has a continuous flow. So that rock sitting in the middle of that stream, no matter how hard, how large, or how formed it looks, after years of the running stream going over the surface of that rock, eventually it becomes a smooth, tiny stone that can be placed in the hand of a faithful individual who can slay the giant. America needs an awakening. An awakening is not a moment. It's not a month. It's not a year. An awakening is decades long. And oftentimes, I've heard this said before, God oftentimes starts a sentence in one decade and doesn't finish it for several after it. That's why it's hard for us. In a microwave generation, in an era when our desire is to have answers like that, it's really difficult for us as the body of believers in Christ to say, I can wait, I can endure, I can go back to the disciplines that the apostles taught us, that our Savior taught us, and lean into those moments and trust that if I am faithful in my context, if I do what God has called me to do, He will deliver the solutions. That's a hard answer. Why is that a hard answer? It's a hard answer because we've been raised now and we live in a mimetic Generation, me Macy's. We all now, we live in this culture where we believe that we can define our reality. And part of our reality as believers is, I want to see this generation changed. I want to see my nation turned upside down. I want to see the, the world moved and shaken. I want to fulfill the purpose God has for me, whatever that looks like. Well, we, like the world, have embraced this very short-term philosophy. There's some farmers in here. The farmers understand, you plant a seed, you got to wait for months. you got to tend to that seed. you got to Cultivate, you've got to make sure that the, the weeds don't take root. There's a lot of work that you have to do to make sure that you get a yield of a crop. We have such a short-minded approach 
that we look for revival and instant answers and we forget that true and ultimate and lasting change can only come from a true awakening. I think that not only do we have the challenge of a very short-term and short-sighted perspective on our contemporary context, I think the second issue that we face is we misunderstand the culture to whom we are speaking. In Acts 2, when Peter preached the sermon after the baptism of the Holy Spirit filled him, he was preaching to brethren. He was preaching to people with a worldview in Jerusalem who came specifically to celebrate a feast. They were fluent in the dictates of Scripture. They understood that there was a God. This was simply the fulfillment of the prophecy of that. The culture that was there was ideal for the manner in which he was speaking to awaken their hearts to send them into the fire. But if we fast forward to Acts 16, when Paul goes out to preach the gospel, it's a different crowd entirely. It is not a people that have the worldview and understanding of faith. They don't even believe in God. They believe in multiple gods. They believe in all of these crazy ideologies that the idea of there being one God is, is anathema to them. That's a very different context. I think sometimes we preach as a church as if we're speaking to an Acts 2 crowd. When the only way an awakening will happen is if the Acts 2 crowd gets into the Acts 16 mindset. Mm. Understanding that who we are speaking to now with less than 50% of America's population attending church, the lowest ebb in the history of that specific statistic being recorded, we are speaking now as a minority, not a majority. Being a minority in a, different, in a secular culture is different than being a majority in a culture where a biblical worldview is understood. And that's why this is, I'm not, this is not to disparage Billy Graham, but Billy Graham is not the answer for this cultural moment. Billy Graham was the answer when he was placed in the time in which he was placed. Because when he spoke, the stadiums would be filled and there were people that already had a predisposition to hearing, understanding, and living out the gospel. But there's a lot of great ministers today that are preaching the same words, with the same fire, and the same passion, and in some cases with the same filled stadiums. But the question I ask is, why are those filled stadiums not turning into culture that has been transformed? I think it's because we're looking at it from an Acts 2 revival mindset, and we need an Acts 16 awakening mindset. <coughs> And the church has to recognize that we must look like the Apostle Paul and how we deliver a message to a foreign culture. We must understand the times, the worldview, the mimetic worldview versus the poetic worldview. We have people that have adopted the poet, poesia worldview. So what does all this mean? Well, I, I think as you look at the Apostle Paul, what we understand is that when Paul saw an effect, it followed the presentation of the power of the gospel. If we are anemic in our walk with God, if we do not see the manifestation of the power of God in our individual lives, in our families, in our prayer time, we are not going to see the power of God transforming the hearts and minds of a generation that does not know Him. The farthest distance in the world, they say, beyond the diameter of the earth is from here to here, from your head to your heart. I think what's challenging for us is we're not even here any longer. There are people that are totally uh, ignorant of the Scriptures and of anything that relates to them. The story of the gospel to some people is the first time they've ever heard of Jesus. I've, I've taken somebody a Bible, they've never seen it before. We are now speaking to a generation fully ignorant of the truth. And we must understand that when we step into this context and understand that if the church wants to see an awakening in our nation, it starts with an awakening in our own souls. It starts with the practice of the disciplines, of getting on our knees, doing the hard thing, reading scripture every day, filling ourselves with the power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit when we least want to. That's the answer. It's not going to happen fast. It's going to happen over a broad period of time where a wholly committed people of God are committed to seeing Him work within their lives on a daily basis. So the order with which that happens is first, you have to be right vertically. If we're going to do anything horizontally, you have to be right Vertically. That's why I love groups like these, because groups like these challenge us and cultivate us and build a context of discipleship. If we don't have that context, it's going to be difficult for us as individuals isolated in this world to have any power in the way that we preach and teach and reach the lost generation. The second thing that we have to have after our relationship vertical is our family. It's that priority. I have a story out. He'll remain nameless because people might know him, but it's a story of a man whose father was an amazing missionary in the nation of India. This amazing missionary would preach the gospel. He knew nine languages, and there were times when he'd be in a dry riverbed with thousands of people 
poor Indi indigenous people with his wife. He would be preaching, he would translate from one language to the next language to the next, next language and would do that for hours on end as these people came to hear the gospel for the first time. There was a revival that took place in southern India as a result of this man's teaching and preaching. But you know what happened? While he was out these decades saving the lost, his sons were in boarding school being abused. He abandoned them in their moments of greatest need. And it led to the story of a wayward son who thankfully, like the prodigal, came back home because of the faithfulness of Christ. But the destructive path that he walked on, I believe, was largely a part of fatherlessness. It was a man who prioritized a mission on earth to others over the prioritization of his family. Fatherlessness is the greatest plague on society today. Without a father in the home, this is, the, this is how the family will always be the story that lasts because God made it this way. Without a father in the home, without a mother in the home, the child is at a tremendous disadvantage. And when fathers disabandon that post, they place their children at tremendous risk. Praise God for the faithful families that are in this room. We must communicate to others the urgency of being a boring dad who is present at his games. What do kids need? They need quality and quantity of time. The dad who's present in his son or daughter's life, who's there to, to answer the questions, who's there to play with him in the mud, who's there to do things that he least likes. And believe me, this, as much as I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself. We need dads who are willing to step in to do the things that are most important, which are far greater than the pressing need of your corporation, your ministry, your church. That's what matters most, is you meeting, meeting the needs of your children and discipling them to understand the times. But that goes back to the first point. If you are not in relationship with God, if your vertical relationship is not right, you're going to be handicapped in how you invest in your children, which leads me to the next level of influence. And that's extended family, friends, and I would include in that the church. We must have a group of people with whom we can walk this life, not alone. Our families must have connection to others who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose and are living in such a way that they're advancing the cause and call of the gospel. If we live as an isolated family in a manner that is totally deserted, from the rest of civilization and society, and there are no other believers that surround us, it leads to the potential of error in our doctrines, and it leads to potential issues that children have to face as they seek to wrestle with those questions that we all have to face eventually in the world. It is critical that we have a body of believers that surrounds us. And when we do, the encouragement that follows, I think one of the biggest tragedies of COVID, as Greg mentioned earlier, was the disabandonment of the church. Do not neglect the assembling of the saints, is what the scriptures say. We were neglected. And in that neglect, for the first time in millennia, we didn't have service on Resurrection Sunday, on the day that seals salvation for many people. We didn't have it last year. That tragedy caused us I, countless harms that I can't even measure. After that, I believe, with those foundations in place, after that, I believe that's when we can re re meet, reach and meet the needs of the secular world that is desperately in need of an answer. And if those things aren't in place, I'm sorry, but our responses will continue to be anemic, blunted by this world. The forces of darkness will continue to prevail in the lives of people who desperately need Christ. Yeah, we might be saved and we might be set apart in our own circles, but that set apartness isn't going to happen. And I believe the future of our nation will be in a situation of tremendous danger, to say the least. So the idea of subsidiarity, taking it back down to the local level, is, I believe, it sounds boring, it sounds cliche. My empirical evidence as I looked at the lives of millennials, as I was, we were talking about this earlier, the evidence proves that the, when it comes to voting in the ballot box, the one thing that influences a voter more than anything else, it's not mainstream media, it's not their slanted education, it's not what's on social media that day. Believe it or not, it is an authentic relationship with somebody who has knowledge and trust in their lives. That relationship, that interpersonal dialogue with somebody that you trust has the power to transform your perspective, even at the ballot box, even if you've been far left of center in Seattle, Washington for your life, a long-term relationship with somebody that invests into your life and helps you understand the broader implications of your worldview with the right questions, that is what leads to transformation at the ballot box. Now, we know the ballot box matters, but what matters so much more is your faith with the Lord. So it always starts there, but I found many political conversations leading me to deep conversations of salvation. 
God's power working within and through that context. So there's this passage of scripture I'd like to uh, remind you of, and it comes from uh, Luke 19. Um, and, you know, I totally forgot there was a verse I was going to read at the beginning, but maybe I'll, I'll flip it at the end. Um, so that verse is actually on my screen right now. So I'm going to start with that. Uh, are you guys familiar with 2 Chronicles 7.14? Are you familiar with that passage of scripture? It's a powerful scripture. I strongly recommend it. and It's something that I've heard over and over again. In fact, there's an app called If714. And every morning, every morning at 7.14 a.m. and every night at 7.14 p.m., I get a notification that I need to pray for my nation. And it says, In my people, if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. If my people. It starts in that reverse order. The most important thing in life is that which the world tells us is least important. It's that which seems to have the least amount of priority. It's that relationship with God. It's that quiet time. It's that engagement. It's that cultivation of a strong spirit in a weak flesh, a flesh crucified to the cross. Nevertheless, not I, but Christ lives in me, is what Paul said. That process of, of boarding this is what here is the formula that is used in Scripture time and time again. When a nation repents and seeks the face of God, that's when God comes in and heals the land. It follows that pathway. Hey, cutie. I think she's still happy, so I'll take that as a continued motion. Well, for those that know 2 Chronicles 7.14, they forget that there's a verse that precedes 2 Chronicles 7.14, and that's 7.13. What does that say? It says, if I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, what did we have in 2020? We had droughts, severe droughts. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land, we literally had an infestation of locusts on the west coast of the United States in 2020. Or if I send a plague among my people, what was the plague we had in 2020? COVID-19. Then if my people who are called by my name. Wow, the ingredients are here. We are living in a moment that is written in the scripture. Before anybody ever thought we would live besides God alone, he knew that we were predestined to live in 2021 with a, in a situation where we have a nation flailing, barely holding on. We have wealth and power and majesty and we have economic gain, but we are losing our heart for the Lord. We live in a context that is damaging the hearts and the lives and the minds of a generation of fatherless children who are in dire need of an answer right now. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, repent of their sins, fast and seek my face. How many of you have a fasting life? How many of you fast and pray to the Lord and seek him out and are willing to put a meal on the table and say, I'm willing to neglect this meal so that God can do his work. I argue we're too selfish. I'm too selfish. I have too many desires to fulfill of my flesh to do the things that most matter. Well, right here it speaks to what has to happen if we are to see a nation changed. And I'm speaking in these macro terms, but honestly, we can't change the nation. We in this room. Yeah, it would take thousands of groups like these all across the country meeting doing this to see a transformation in the nation. All that we can do is we can transform our community. We can transform our school district. We can transform our block, our neighborhood. We can only affect and impact the lives of those people that God has placed strategically within our reach. We've gone to the farthest reaches of the world and have neglected to reach out to our neighbors. Our neighbors need us. Our neighbors need our knowledge of truth. They need our love, our passion. You know what they need more than anything else with this worldview of poesia? They need the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without that, there will not be change. Let's start here. Let's start now. Let's start in our local area. Let's forget about the reaches of the nation and the world. Let's start where God has called us and placed us to be a moment of the sons of Issachar, understanding the times and responding appropriately and accordingly. Luke 19 talks about the parable of the steward, but I want to read one verse from this parable. Are you familiar with the parable of the steward where the king gives ten ta or five talents to one, two talents to the other, one talent to the other, and the guy with five goes out, invests, gets doubled. The guy with two goes out, invests, gets doubled. And the guy with one goes and hides his talent in the ground. Well, let me help you understand why the guy with one talent invested his talent into the ground. I don't blame him. Listen to this. All right, Luke 19, 14. It says, but his citizens, talking about the king now, the king who gave these minas or these talents away, it says, but his citizens hated him 
and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Wow. Sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? I don't want God reigning over me. I define my truth. I define my reality. You bring to me the idea of a God. Oh, no, I don't want any of that. I don't want him reigning over me. I decide my destiny. It was in that environment that these individuals invested with these talents had to go to these very people and say, hey, I'm going to make this investment here and I want to see a return like this for the guy that you most hate. Does that sound like an environment where you want to invest your talents? I don't think so. I, I run a business. I want to use my resources wisely where I'm going to generate the most return. Jesus says that the one talent servant who has, in response to that environment hid his talent in the ground was wicked would face weeping and gnashing of teeth, did not deserve to be in his presence. That was the punishment for the one talent servant. Can you believe it? Think about that. I think it's a logical response to the environment. So too, we now in this place and in this time, we face dangers that many Americans have never faced in the past. We live in a new moment, a cultural moment that is perilous. Investing our lives into a family that may be broken, may have a worldview that is anti-theatical, anti anti anti-God, anti-religion. And we seek to go and invest the seeds of the gospel. They're going to be trampled upon. We might be made fun of. We might be mocked or ashamed. We might even be in prison. There's a pastor in Alberta, Canada, who's been in prison because he dared to hold service during COVID-19. We face all of these challenges from an environmental standpoint. If I'm betting on somebody, I'm betting on the left and the power of the government to shut down the church. That would be my bet. But what's God's commandment to his servants with those talents in that environment? It's not to refrain. It's not to draw back, it's to go in, it's to attack. It's to be in a mode of the power of the Spirit of God without refrain to tell them what the truth is because the truth will set them free. So that leads me to the seven spheres of culture. And one of the responses that the church has had, I think in many ways, a particular and a universal I think the church has bought a lot of what secular culture has told us in many ways. And one of the things that secular culture has told us is there is a separation of church and state. And there's many Supreme Court cases, the most famous one going back to 1943 with a guy named Justice Hugo Black. Justice Hugo Black said, quoting Thomas Jefferson in a letter he wrote to the Danbury Baptist, that there is a wall of separation. The church cannot be involved in governing affairs. And guess what that wall of separation did? Well, it kept growing and growing and growing to the point where no prayer in schools, no federal funding for anything that remotely relates to evangelism. You can't even have crosses on the side of the road for state troopers who have given their lives because that is a separation. That is a violation of separation of church and state. No longer does secular society believe that we should have the free exercise of religion. What does the First Amendment say? Anybody know? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free what? Exercise. Exercise, practice. What does the secular world tell us? Oh, practice your religion in your churches. We support that. We want pastors' protection bills. We want you pastors to feel free. You can preach what you want in your space. You can pre preach what you want in your four walls. You're welcome to maintain your theology and your ideology in the, in the calm and quiet of your home. But when it comes to exercising your faith, the moment you take a step out of those four walls, you better not share a word about what you believe in. It is condemned. It is evil. You cannot exercise your faith freely is what secular society would have us believe. Well, that separation of church and state has not only plagued the mountain of influence of government, it has reached the other mountains. When you go into your workplace in business and you dare try to share the gospel with somebody, in fact, who was just telling me this? Oh, okay, I'll go to education in a second. But you, you dare try to share the gospel in your workplace, what happens? Now, you could be fired. If you offend somebody, for something you said, you could be gone. We were just talking about Eastwood, Eastwood schools. There was a student there, a young boy, they were teaching about uh, transgender theory in eighth grade. And this individual said, I don't like homosexuality. I believe it was something to that, to that effect. He got suspended. He got suspended for saying that. And then in appeal to the suspension, they said, well, we have to uphold this because you have white privilege. That is the belief in the adoption of the church, the separation of church and state. Why for years the church has had the ability to wield and influence culture and we have bought the myth and the lie that the church is not allowed to be influential in culture. We've taken that seed and have allowed it to run roughshod over our ability to communicate, or our calling to communicate the gospel. Am I calling for theocracy? Of course not. There's a lot longer conversation to that. 
All I'm saying is that the church has adopted what the world has told us, and we've allowed them to decide and dictate exactly what our calling is and what our responsibilities are. I think as I look at those mountains of influence, and I look specifically at the mountain of government where many believers have abandoned that mountain for that very reason, in some cases, for the reason of the separation of church and state, or for another reason, being that it's too corrupt. I dare not touch a mountain of that level of corruption. There's too many corrupt officials and politicians that I don't want to be corrupted myself, or it's evil, Satan has it. I want you to tell me this. Tell me one square inch on the face of this planet that Jesus doesn't call out from heaven and say, mine. Is there one? That's Chuck Colson. No, every space on the planet Earth and beyond, he calls his own. In fact, Colossians 1 says that by his word, all things are held together. So I happen to believe that the space that we need to be most active in, if you're called to this, in my specific calling, the spaces that we must be engaged in are those spaces that have now been pervaded with darkness. The places where Darkness rules and reigns. God gives us gifts and talents, and those gifts and talents inform us as to where we're going to invest those. I bet you the talents that Jesus spoke about, they were probably the five talents, the two talents, and the one. They were probably different ways, there were probably different places that those individuals could have invested those talents and still gotten a return by God's grace and bounty. You might have a gifting in the arts and entertainment arena. You might have a gifting in education. You might have a, a gifting to be involved in journalism or the media. Those giftings, God is calling you to use those. He's given you a context clue as to what you are supposed to do. Well, one of those mountains that I, I um, personally have been given a gifting in is the area of politics, the area of government. And what I found on my journey, which has lasted now um, over the last five years, but probably more a decade in terms of my research, uh, is that there aren't many, there's a strong contingent, but there, there aren't many people that have a broad enough worldview to understand the times to respond appropriately to the issues at hand. I think there's a lot of people with really good intentions but very few have the understanding of the times. And I'm, I'm guessing that that issue that pervades the church using Big C is tied to the root of the foundation of the issue that I talked about earlier. I think we, we misunderstand what our response is to be. And I believe that in spite of the, the many issues that it faces, that doesn't mean that the, the individuals that may lack that context need to shrink back. No, I, I think it just means we need to press in. We need to press into the Lord to gain the knowledge of the context of the season and the environment in which we're in. And he will give us a word to speak when we're faced with the challenges and trials and travails that stand in front of us. So one of the ways that I am responding, and uh, I have Jose here. I'm going to ask Jose, if he, if Jose, could you come up for a second? Before I introduce him, though, let me give you a little bit of context. So um, there's not a lot of people that have as much uh, fluency in local politics, and it kind of seems like a boring thing. By the way, Alexei de Tocqueville, in his book, Democracy in America, written in 1835, said that what made America strongest was the fact that you had citizens jealous for subsidiarity, for the local township. That in the New England states, you would see a thousand people invested and engaged in making sure that there was a pothole in the road. That individual that was supposed to take care of that pothole would be held accountable to making sure the pothole was fixed. And there was rotating processes. It was a, a process where he says, I love this distinction. He said that the townships lent their leaders to the state and federal government. It wasn't vice versa. Whereas in France, and this is the distinction, he's writing it for the nation of France. In France, the government lent their officials to the townships. It was power from beneath. It was power from the, the local vantage point. So in local politics, one of the things that I've seen is so many people, the only thing they care about is what's happening in Washington, D.C. That's all we see in the media. That's all that we know about. That's all that we hear about. We forget that the county treasurer or the county clerk of courts has some, thankfully still today, still has some major influence and impact in our lives. So when I became chairman in 2016, there's a much longer story that I won't have time to get into. But when I became chairman, actually it wasn't until 2017, but I started getting involved in 16, I started learning about the influence of these local offices. And one of the things that, that I learned is that almost everybody attributes blame to the party as long as you carry the name. So even though I'm a local county party chairman, I'm getting blamed for Mitch McConnell's actions in Kentucky. I'm getting blamed for President Trump's uh, X, Y, or Z thing. And I, I, after the election, I received hundreds of emails, hundreds of calls with F you and all sorts of crazy, terrible emails with people condemning me because I, I didn't do enough or we had given Trump free reign and he was doing whatever he wanted, all sorts of blame and and I usually just discard it because 
I know that there's a lack of knowledge and understanding that while you have a RNC, you have a national party that works with the president, you have a state party that works with your statewide office holders, then you have 88 county parties in the state of Ohio that focus on the local. Um, so that's my usual response. But what I found is usually that local response would, would satisfy. I, I could find um, a, a, that logic and reasoning would make them say, okay, I understand that. That makes sense now. Let me be engaged with you and find a way to affect that which is here locally. Even if I disagree with you on what's happening nationally, let's find a way to do something here locally. What I found after the 2020 election is that wasn't working. And uh, Jose here uh, called me up in the morning and he said, John, what are you going to do about this? <laughs> I am doing something about this. He said, no, no, I, I, you need to understand. Like, I don't know anything about what's going on in the county. There's problems in our nation. There's something wrong and you're not addressing the issues. Like, Jose, I, I, like, why are you calling me? I've had all these other hated emails and <laughs> I'm not doing enough. And here he is telling me that I'm part of the problem. So, you know, I, I trust him enough to allow him to tell his story and give me his angle. But that conversation was incredibly revealing to me because he revealed to me something I couldn't quite see, but now know. So I'm going to have Jose tell us what it was that was frustrating to you and what led to the initiative that follows. You know, when you are in Guatemala, you see all the movies of United States and Hollywood and all that stuff and the Ten Commandments when you see Moises back in time, you know, all that movies, great movies, see all that stuff. And I know more of the history because of the movies. So the movies, they are great. <laughs> you have to watch the movies. I, lo I love the movie Patriot. If you see that by, yeah. right, that's a good movie. But uh, you learn a lot in that stuff. And after I read more than 100 questions they had to enter to, to pass my citizenship, uh, my citizenship test, and they make you to write, we the people of United States. And that test, they are pretty good because they teach you to be a patriot. Birth the certificate of being a citizen of the United States, I was in the middle of a lot of people coming from different parts of the, from different parts of the world. Muslims, Iranians, Chinese, ja uh, Asians, Japanese, Latin America. I saw one woman that was so happy. I, I saw the other people were so happy, all that stuff. And I never understand the amendments of the Constitution to that moment. Why? Because these people is running because they don't have freedom of, of speech, freedom of religion. All this beautiful Constitution have here in the United States. And now, somehow, the evil wants to take it. So in that moment, I understand the Constitution and I work hard to send my kids to a private school, and that's no white privilege. I just work hard, I'm, I'm Latino. <laughs> yeah, I just been seven years here. After seeing all this beautiful country that you guys have, and you've been traveling around the world, you see how is the other countries, the devil, and you know, all, whatever happened with all the people is brothers and sisters. Doesn't, you know, doesn't matter what color they are, all this stuff. They just have the run through. But they're still brothers and sisters, and they had to see the love of the Father, the love of Jesus. But the only way to see it is through you. But that's the reason I stand for, and I support what I believe, what you guys believe, because everything starts here and here. And uh, that's the reason all call, and his call is, what are we going to do about it? What is next? So I'll keep that short and brief, but I, I really want to get to the point where we are today and, and what all this means. Um, so about a month ago, Rossford High School, uh, no, the administration held a training on a Saturday for every single one of the member of the board, school board, uh, all the principals, all the teachers, all the administration. And the training was on transgender theory and critical race theory. And they wanted their Teachers, they wanted everybody from bottom to the top. This was done by the administration, not sanctioned by the board. Their board was invited. And they trained them on uh, what the, the lessons were that were necessary to understand in the modern context in which we live and how to respond accordingly. So for those who argue that the, the threats of, um, of the secular left have not invaded places like Wood County, Ohio, you're wrong. It's already here. It's already here. It's established. You heard the story of the, the boy from Eastwood. So when Jose made the clarion call, I asked the question, the way that this power is being made manifest with ideologies that are uh, counter the gospel, the way it's being done is through political power. You find people that gain elected office, 
And those people that gain elected office choose people. Those choose people that are their, their agents or secretaries. Those people bring their specific agenda and they integrate it and implement it. So how do you counter political power? It's an obvious answer, with political power. So as Jose was explaining to me, the disillusionment, the, the feelings of disenfranchisement, of disconnection, of, of sadness, of feeling helpless. As I heard that from hundreds of people, I started putting two and two together. And I realized that part of the symptom is for too long we think that all the answers are in D.C., but if we bring the concept of subsidiarity, focusing on the local, focusing on the school board, to life, maybe these people that feel disconnected might feel connected. Those people who feel like they have no influence, maybe they'll find influence if they can recognize the power of their voice at the local level. And that led to the 1776 Initiative. The 1776 Commission issued a report. This was Trump's uh, commission. The report, Larry Arn, Dr. Arn, we talked about earlier, he was uh, the chair of the commission, created a report. That report uh, was launched in January, and then Biden, upon taking office, what was his first act as president, was to cancel the 1776 Commission. But my friends, you can't cancel the rights that come from God. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These things come from a much higher source than any vestige of power that exists. So I, I saw that and said, okay, we have a great opportunity here. Let's take the findings of this report. Let's take the, the, the teaching. Let's take, what, let's take what is best about that and let's train these individuals to use that knowledge as power in a local context. So we created what's called the 1776 Initiative. We have 22 facilitators. Our very first training is going to happen probably on May 13th. We're going to send a letter to every Republican household in Wood County. And we are going to do a monthly club. It's like a book club where they're going to go through three resources. One is the 1776 report. It's only 42 pages long. So it's pretty short. We broke it down into sections. They're going to go through Bellwether Blues and we're giving everyone that attends a free copy. And then they're going to go through a local government training that we've created. And then every month as they go through that content, there's going to be one exercise that they're responsible for. One exercise is have a conversation with somebody about why they voted the way they voted. Another, another exercise or homework assignment is to call your local commissioner. Another one is to call your local school board. Another one is to read the 1619 curriculum. So there's assignments every month that follow the activity of reading. And then at the end of the nine months, after they finished all of the curriculum, they will have the option, if they have enough interest, to become a formal Republican club. Now, what is that? Well, that is political power. A Republican club's job is to find a local group of people committed to holding leadership in their local school boards, especially their townships, their cities, holding them accountable to advance principles that are going to affect the next generation. They will receive resources and funding and then will be empowered to have influence in their local community. So that is 1776 report and it's an answer to the many of the questions that I've talked about tonight. Uh, the questions that surround how do we respond to a nation that is going in a direction that we don't like? Well, the answer is, is you start locally you find eternal principles, and you recognize that detached from God, we can find ourselves way adrift, that horseshoe concept, right? We can find ourselves way adrift of the true transformation that follows leaders who are founded in the scripture of God. I'd like to pray for you before we get into Q&A. So if you wouldn't mind just bowing your heads and closing your eyes as, as I pray, and uh, being humble enough uh, to invite the Holy Spirit here tonight. Lord, we thank you that you're already here. I thank you that you, uh, you came tonight and you um, you were able to catalyze these individuals, these couples, these families to be inside of this home. I thank you for the Schleter family. I thank you, Lord, that you've given them such tremendous grace and anointing to be able to bring a group like this people together for such a time as this. God, I thank you that every individual inside of this room has a very specific calling, a specific anointing, a specific gifting for this hour on this earth. I pray, God, that they would recognize that you have given them, given them talents, not to hide or to put away or to save for another day. You have given them talents to invest those talents into the local context in which they have been given. God, I pray that these people with the fire of the Holy Spirit would recognize that our investment into society with these talents is nothing. It is meaningless unless the power of the gospel motivates us and empowers us to go out to share your truth with the lost to bring with our words the power that raised our Savior and Lord from the grave. God, I pray that that power would now reside amongst these individuals, that as they leave here tonight, they would recognize that it is not by power nor by might, but it is by the Spirit of the living God of hosts, says the Lord. 
And I pray that you would use them in a dynamic way, but that they would not give up, that they would not hold back, that, that they would not see it as a one-day, one-time revival-like impact, but Lord, they would be committed to the long haul, that they would not grow weary in doing good, for in due season they will see an increase for the investment they have made. I now pray a blessing upon their lives, a blessing upon their families, and an anointing, an understanding of the times in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the 1619 Project created by the New York Times received a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, so the, the idea of the 1619 Project is that America um, was not founded in 1776. Rather, America was founded in 1619 when they ascribed the, the first instance of slavery being on the mainland United States. They're actually incorrect in that. It was back in the 1500s when the first slaves were present in the U.S. And they say that uh, America's founding, therefore, is, was created with the entirety of establishing a stronghold for slavery. So they remove all the language and say that language was simply a justification and therefore America is evil. It's always been evil and it will remain evil unless we topple the system of government that exists. So the 1619 Project ushers in what is a, um, a version of critical race theory. Have you guys heard of critical race theory? Yeah, critical race theory is the idea that your value is defined by how oppressed you are. So if you're a minority, if you're a sexual minority, LGBTQ minority, if you're a female, um, how those things relate is another story. Uh, if you have a, a, a minority ethnicity, if you have a minority religion, then you gain points on the scale of intersectionality. So the more oppressed you are, the more value you have in society and the more rights you have to have your voice asserted. And we must topple this system that 76 created with the presumed nature of equality being the justification to create equity. All right, long story there, can't get into it, but let me just say, 1619, uh, here's, here's a quote from George Orwell, 1984, great book, highly recommend it, we're living a lot of that out. George Orwell said that uh, he who controls the present controls the past, and whoever controls the past controls the future. The 1619 curriculum is intended to control the future, but they use it by first manipulating the past to fit an agenda that becomes a power play. That's why creating a shield around our public school systems is absolutely necessary before that ideology gets out in our systems, our freedoms, beyond our freedoms, the values, the checks and balances that exist before those things are taken away. How do you see the hope for unity of the church being one church responding to the full truth of the gospel of what Christ revealed for the formid formidability of his purpose and power to be manifest. Built into this is sort of like the Catholic evangelical question. How do you see maybe some of that playing out in the past year? Ooh, that is a tough one. Um, I, I actually think the answer goes back to understanding the times. Um, I think it's being sons of Issachar. If we understand the urgency of the times and the urgency for what we live, the small pity differences that exist between denominations start to fade away because we have a very clear enemy and a very clear mission that lies ahead of us. And if we see that clear enemy and we have a clear mission and we recognize our mandate from God, it's very easy for me to lock arms with somebody with whom I'm going to disagree on maybe the sacraments or the power of the Holy Spirit as it's manifested with the speaking in evidence of speaking in tongues or is it evidence of fire or healing. I might have a lot of differences with them on the non-essentials, but on the essentials, we are aligned. We are aligned in mission. And one of the things that actually makes it easy for me, I, I think on the mountain of government, it's the easiest place to be ecumenical because it's there where you see the most formidable opponents to what is good and beautiful and true. And it's easy to align with somebody regardless of their background, atheist, Mormon, I don't care. If they have a similar alignment to you and are willing to advocate for a candidate or a principle or a policy, you know that that's going to have a benefit for society at large. So being, being like sons of Issachar would be my quick answer. Well, we've heard a lot about millennials and, you know, all the stereotypes that fit them. And I wanted to understand what's happening with my generation. So I look at millennials. I do, um, you know, secondary research to understand what the empirical evidence says. And what's happening amongst millennials is there is a shift that's happening away from the left. Right? The left is going radically far left of center. And in the process, they're abandoning millennials who have been taught to think like them. And that abandonment has kind of left them in the middle. But that doesn't mean they're embracing the principles of conservatism. All right. They're finding themselves caught with the blues. That's where the title comes from. They have the blues. They're, they're saddened. They're disillusioned. They're frustrated. They're skeptical. All right. So the millennials are caught in this middle ground. And my challenge to conservatives is how can we be more effective at winning them? 
And I think the, the answer to your question from the, the political worldview standpoint, um, as I talk about with the stories of seven millennials who embrace a different candidate than they voted for four years prior to, it was a journey they went on. And the journey that they went on led to them recognizing that when I go to the ballot box, I'm not voting for a personality. I'm not voting for uh, an eloquent leader. I'm actually voting for certain principles that are going to have ramifications on my life. Winston Churchill once quipped that if you're not uh, liberal at the age of 25, you have no heart. If you're not conservative by the age of 35, you have no brain. Okay? <laughs> That's attributed to him. And what he's saying is as you age and as you have kids, you start to think differently as you view the world. And you start to think about how and what is the role of government and how is it going to impact me and my family members and future generations. And as you think that way, you start to look at it from a different vantage point. And these seven millennials, Jose included, as they started to study the issue, they started to get a why, a why government exists. And that why led them on deeper questions of certain issues that motivated them, whether it was the pro-life issue. I, I would make this argument, by the way. I think the most powerful policy that we can get across the finish line, if we can get the next generation to embrace the pro-life ethic, it will be like liberating them from slavery to freedom. I truly believe that. If you can awaken them to recognize the value of life from the womb, you will see the uh, transformed perspective at the ballot box. So I believe that is the, I call it the underground railroad to freedom, the free thinking. Um, so the rest of the issues are tied to an understanding of the why at the ballot box that moves away from just basic fame, politics by fame. Thank you. You're doing a great job, and I wish I could memorize everything you said and take it home to everybody. It's, it's been wonderful. I'm here. <laughs> you can help take it home too. So, <laughs> so you um, you talked about the need for relationships, and I'm in the oldest generation. We're kind of in the winter of our lives, but the people in the winter have a lot of memory and a lot of history, uh, a lot of institutional situations that we've gone through. I reflect back on and remember going to a community meeting with before uh, Steve Stiver was elected, and. I can't remember what the situation was, but there was not an indication that it was pro-life. And the person who was his um, campaign manager was Catholic, and I asked him if he would bring Steve over for coffee. And they came over for coffee. His wife is expecting a baby, and I've been very much a part of post-abortion healing, and told stories. And when he left that day, he said, nothing will ever be the change again. But I'm thinking how easy those things are because I think we isolate ourselves thinking we're done, our age is done, situation is different, our friendships are different. Um, I, I guess what I'm leaving with is just wonderful, wonderful information, but just remembering that a cup of coffee has a lot of power, and I just thank you for that reminder. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful um, answer and the culmination of my research. Uh, one, one of the things we talked about right before the uh, the conversation tonight is in my research, uh, the one thing that I found that was most influential was that conversation. But do you know why authentic relationship is that much more valuable for millennials and Gen Zers? Do you, do you know why? It's because we've lost authentic relationship as a generation. What are we doing all day? We are on our phones. We're behind screens. The humanity of face-to-face -face conversations has been lost. The art of communication in fact, studies have proven that as younger generations rise, they become weaker in communication in spite of the fact that they communicate more than any generation prior to. Why are they weaker and unable? It's because they've been handicapped because we're behind screens and we lose the face of the human person that's in front of us. So that means that the currency of authentic relationship carries that much more weight in this moment right now. The best thing you could possibly do, if you want to persuade somebody, invite them out for coffee, invite them out to lunch, you don't have to have an agenda beyond saying, I'm going to invest in your life. I'm going to care about you. I'm going to care about your future. And over time, they will get to the point where they want to hear what you have to say. They're going to want to understand what your opinions are. And you will carry far more influence than you could ever imagine. It's not the big answer. It's not the atomic bomb answer, the nuclear answer, if you would. It is the slow awakening of the soul. It's the, it's the shaping of the rock to become that pebble that God can use. Right now is an important moment in human history, and you and I are appointed and anointed to play an important role. What preceded was delivered at a recent Belief in Beverages Night, sponsored by Image Trinity and Mass Impact. Jonathan Jakubowski, a dynamic young husband, father, business leader, author, speaker, and movement leader, painted a moving portrait of what might happen if we rediscovered the human heart 
endowed by God with the capacity to unite local communities to work together towards that which is true and good. Together, we are about the awakening heart of conservatism. If you are interested in helping us extend this message and movement further, find out more and please financially support us. Go to ilovemyfamily.us. That's ilovemyfamily.us. God bless you.